Hello, and welcome to Onward, the Fundrise podcast, where you can find out more about what's happening at Fundrise and where you'll hear some in-depth conversations about the big trends affecting the U.S. and global economies. We are recording this on Thursday, August 10th, 2023. And before we start today's show, we'd like to ask that you please keep rating and reviewing the show in those podcast apps. We love hearing from our listeners, and we have heard from so many listeners. Good feedback. Occasionally, some constructive criticism, and we love that too. And we want all of it, so keep rating and reviewing. Also, evergreen reminder that this podcast is not investment advice. It is intended for informational and entertainment purposes only. With that, let's get on with the show. This is the Don't Look Back in Anger, Look Back in Search of Lessons episode. I'm Cardiff Garcia of Bizarre Audio, and I'm joined as always by CEO of Fundrise and resident financial historian, Ben Miller. Ben, how are you, man? Cardiff, happy summer. Yeah, same to you. And as we get on into the late summer, you've been doing a little bit of reflecting on the past. And there's a topic that I believe you are obsessed with. Is that is that too strong to say? Yeah, obsessed with. That you want to talk about today on the show? What is it? Yeah, the SNL crisis. So you know, as, as I say many times, I'm obsessed with like learning the lessons of history because you, if you understand sort of why something is and where it came from, you're more likely to be able to have a good idea where it's going. And the savings and loan crisis is a period that most people don't know anything about. It sort of receded into ancient history. And it's funny because it's, you know, I'm obsessed with it for a bunch of reasons. Let me give you the, let me like list them out for you because really like three reasons Three reasons why. Okay. Reasons for obsession with the savings and loan crisis of roughly the late 70s through the early 90s. So people like you and I were kids, um, but a lot of people in finance now were too young to have some sense of it, uh, of why it mattered so much and the scale of the crisis. But yeah, tell us, why Why are you so obsessed with it? Okay. So because I think of it as there's like three epics of finance in American history. There's a pre-depression. Mm-hmm. There's the depression to the 1980s, and there's the 1980s to now. Okay. And the SNL crisis is the turning point. Like it's the it's the big bang of finance. It's like the origin, and so it birthed modern real estate, which I want to talk about. Okay. It birthed, I think, it actually birthed modern banking, which we can we can talk about. Sure. Uh, it was the first, in my opinion, first nationwide bailout of the banking industry. And it sort of set the template for how um, regulators think about banking crises. I mean, it, it, it really does like foretell the 2008 financial crisis, uncannily so. Um, and then there's all these parallels about sort of patterns of human errors, patterns of human history, or how do gov- government behave on the way up and the way down? How do market participants behave? And so it's like the, the history of it is sort of captures all of those things, which are basically almost everything that matters in finance. And, it, and so that's why I'm both obsessed with it and think it's really important for people to, to know about. So I think, I think listeners are sold. I'm sold, right? <laughs> I, think, I think people are going to stick around for this one, uh, having established why this topic is so interesting and so important. So as a teaser, we are going to first, you and I, Ben, go through some of the history of the savings and loans, and we're going to try to explain in depth, but with clarity, the SNL crisis itself, what actually happened. And then we're going to talk about the lessons of it, why it matters today, uh, and what people should be thinking about, depending on whether you're an investor, whether you're part of a financial institution, a regulator, and so forth. So let's do it. How far back should we start, do you think? Should we go all the way back to the 1830s and the founding, <laughs> the founding of the savings and loans, right? The, uh, the murky origins of the savings and loans is that these were just like collectively gathered pools of money that people would then give to someone to finance a house. Then the money would get paid back and it would be lent out to somebody else. But it was all very informal, right? So these existed that way for a while. But the important thing to note is that they were very simple, okay? You put your money into this thing like a deposit. It was lent out to somebody to finance a home and then it would get paid back. But maybe we should start with the sort of formal establishment of the SNL industry in the early 1930s. So why don't you take it from there? Well, so much of what you learn in history, things that you think of as normal didn't exist before certain dates. You think of like a 
a home mortgage is like a normal thing. Or like being able to save your money somewhere is a normal thing. But if you think back to like, let's just pick the 1930s or some period, you know, around the depression, right? This sort of turning point in banking, right? If you lived in a small town in America, like there was no place to save your money. It wasn't like a thing. Mm -hmm. And there was no place to get a home mortgage. And so like the way mortgages used to work is you'd get them from insurance companies and they were structured very differently than what people think of them now. So they were all balloons, a very short loan that would then come due and you had to pay it all off. And they didn't amortize their interest only. So a lot of times what happened was people would get a mortgage, it would come due and they couldn't get another one and they'd get foreclosed on. And so before the SNLs, there was much more perpetual indebtedness and, and it was just a different dynamic. Most people didn't get to buy homes. They couldn't afford to buy homes, were mortgages for it. If you did borrow, you were often getting in trouble. So you have this sort of like totally different world where there was sort of no financial industry as you think of it today. The big idea was like, let's find a way for people to save money and borrow for creating their home ownership. And that was like a really big idea. I think everybody supported it. And that basically was the impetus behind creating this new idea called a savings and loan thrift. Yeah. And this this happened in the early 1930s when there were a couple of laws passed establishing the industry. And it did a couple of things. One is it formally established the concept of a thrift, which is another word for a savings and loan or an SNL. So those terms you and I are going to be using interchangeably throughout the show. Um, it established thrift and it also established the Federal Savings and Loan Insurance Corporation, which insured some of the deposits that people put into the thrift. So the way these things work is really simple, right? Like they would take deposits and they would use those deposits to then finance home mortgages. That's all they did. And it's crucial for the subsequent history of savings and loans to understand that that's all they were. This is the original like 363, you know, you uh, you put in your money as a deposit, you get paid 3% on the deposit, you lend it out if you're a thrift at 6% and by 3 p.m. you're on the golf course. Thrifts for many, many decades were just that simple. That's all they were designed to do. Yeah. And let me add like uh, probably the most famous thrift in American history is in the movie, It's a Wonderful Life. That's right. Jimmy Stewart. Absolutely. That's a thrift. And so what's different about a thrift than the way people think about banking today is that they were, they were not banks. They only really did one thing and there was no shareholders. It was a mutual. It was owned by the depositors, kind of like the way Vanguard's owned by the uh, investors. Mm -hmm. There wasn't this idea of a, of a bank executive that was getting rich owning the bank. It was owned by the depositors. And so it made the bank very conservative, has simple mission. It was about serving local customers. So that's right. Local savers and local homeowners. And um, I, I just want to emphasize this again, because it's so hard for people to imagine. This, I want to say this happened in our lifetime. Because I remember like before 1990s, everything was regional. Banks were regional, radio, TV, TV, literally you had an antenna and you only could watch local TV, retail, like we're like retail wasn't a national phenomenon. And so like this idea of local co companies serving local co like consumers. Yeah. Um, With personal relationships, by the mm -hmm. way, you knew your banker well. Right. There's a concept they called, quote, neighbors helping neighbors. That was the, the idea of, that was why it's a wonderful life like sort of struck home for so many people. Yeah, and there's a couple of things that are crucial to know from what you just said, crucial to emphasize. One is that thrifts did not lend outside of a certain radius, right? They were serving people who wanted mortgages in their geographic area. The second is that it really was just for mortgages. Thrifts were not making like commercial loans. They weren't making credit card loans, consumer loans and things like that. They had that one specific purpose. OK, they were there to take deposits and lend them out for people who wanted uh, to finance a home, to buy a home. It was a mortgage focused product. And that's what they did for, for many, many decades. We should maybe fast forward a few decades into the post-war era to 1966, when something called Regulation Q 
was passed. This is going to play a big role in what happens later. Do you want to talk about that and why it matters? Yeah, I mean, it, I'll say this, you can add to it. Basically, the idea of home ownership was such a powerful idea. Everyone in Congress really wanted to support home ownership. And one of the things I want to touch on as I talk about this and one of the big lessons is how much these sort of narratives, economic narratives drive everything underneath of it. So you can get technical, you can talk about what's happening in the markets, but it actually these big ideas drive so many of the assumptions of what is a good policy or what's a good investment or a good loan. And so back then, encouraging home ownership was 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 extremely politically popular. And that's the epic I'm talking about from from the end of the depression. And so 1932 is when this uh, Federal Home Loan Bank Act is passed all the way to 1980. Mm-hmm. So that's a long time, 50 years. And in the middle of that 1966, they passed this regulation Q basically is meant to protect the savings and loans because everybody loves them. And it basically caps the amount depositors can get paid in in for saving. And it gives them a higher interest rate. They can basically give depositors 50 bips higher savings rate than banks can. So essentially, right. you're going to put your money with the SNLs because you're going to get paid more to do that. Right. But that amount is capped, right? In other words, uh, if an SNL is now lending money at a certain interest rate and then it's paying its depositors a lower interest rate, it's going to be able to make money. And what Regulation Q did was it capped the amount that SNLs could pay to its depositors. And that is going to play an important role later. So we have to know that that has been established. Some other things were happening in the 1960s and 1970s that are really important to understand. You had very high inflation and you had subsequently very high interest rates later on during the era of Paul Volcker. And so that is something that's going to sort of set up the origins of the crisis. And there's one other thing that happens, which is that mutual funds are introduced into the Mm -hmm. financial landscape, and those end up becoming competitors to the SNLs in a very important way. Um, So that's the 60s and 70s. Uh, But let me let me kick it back to you, Ben. Anything else going on in that era that you think uh, listeners should know about? I think you nail it. I mean, basically, this we're not going to talk about essentially what caused all the inflation, but the short of it is that we end up with a lot of inflation in the 1970s and the interest rates go higher and then they go much higher. But you're talking about even in the 1970s, interest rates go into the into the sort of seven, eight, nine percent. And then at the end of the 70s, going to the 80s, they go to, you know, almost 20 percent. Mm-hmm. And so just to <laughs> That's, yeah, it's it, it it's such a it's such a radical change from the environment that existed before. What do you think about the kind of introduction or the popularization of securitization during this time and uh, the government sponsored entities? How big of a role did things like Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac play? Do you think? Yeah, so I like I I separate the problems into sort of three groups: so assets, deposits, and then profitability. Mm-hmm. Let me just take each in part and we can talk for about- For the thrifts, you For mean. the thrifts. For the, okay, yeah, so sure. basically you're talking about what is the primary way people save and, and get home mortgages. So this is what, what people think of as banking now. And they had approximately a trillion dollars in, in assets back then. And they had made you know millions and millions of home mortgage loans. So the home mortgage loans that went out were typically up around prime. So those loans would be a 5% or 6% loan on a, with a 30-year fixed rate interest. And they would amortize. That was like the big idea is that if basically if you stayed in your home for 30 years, you'd have no home mortgage at the end, your interest rate would be fixed, and the depositor was also a fixed saver. So was, you know, on both sides, it was a fixed rate, and they made a spread, and that was their business pretty simple. Uh, but if you have a trillion dollars of mortgages, at a fixed rate of 5%, let's say, for 30 years, and interest rates go from 5% to 20%, your assets are now, on a, at least on a market basis, worth much less. So that's super similar to what's happened in the last 24 months. That's one clear parallel. And so I'll just give you some math because I think the math of it is like kind of shocking. So, okay, if you have a 30-year mortgage at a 5% interest rate, and interest rates go to 20%. What's that mortgage worth 
according to the markets. Very, very little. Yeah. Why would you buy something that's paying you 5% if now suddenly you can get something that pays you 20%? It's worth 25% of what it used mm. to be worth. So 75% lost just on the interest rate from 5% to 20%. So home's still going to pay back. There's no question about that. But is it, think about a 75% loss across you know the entire mortgage business. The savings and loans effectively were, were going insolvent just because the interest rate difference had marked their assets essentially to a loss. And, and that's not a problem. Have we, <laughs> that's what we just, have just recently seen. As long as you have no forced selling of those mortgages, right? If you can hold those mortgages 30 years, then it, it's fine. You can hold to maturity, as they say. But if you're forced to sell them at market rates and take that loss, then you're insolvent. Yeah. The other problem, by the way, for the SNLs was that suddenly with interest rates so high, depositors weren't as willing to give their money to the SNLs because the SNLs were capped on the interest rate that they could pay depositors. So on the one hand, their assets, which are these mortgage loans that they're giving to borrowers, are losing value because of higher interest rates. But higher interest rates are also making it so that depositors don't want to stay with the SNLs. And their deposits are crucial for financing those very mortgage loans. But instead, depositors are fleeing to get higher deposit rates with money market funds because the SNLs are capped by regulations uh, from paying a higher amount on those deposits. Yeah, it's what's happening today on a, today's a smaller scale, but basically you have uh, higher interest rates than before went from zero to five, and back then it went from five to 20. So there's, there's a difference there. But essentially, today's mortgage, I'll just do the math for today. If you had a 30-year mortgage at a 3% interest rate, which a lot of people have 3% interest rate in their mortgage for 30 years, and interest rates went to 6%, which is actually probably interest rates today are closer to seven. But just at 6%, that mortgage today is worth 40% less. Hmm. So probably 7%, 50% less. So there's a 40 to 50% loss on today's 3% mortgage just now, 6 or 7%. So it's very similar. And if you're a depositor, right, you moved your money out of uh, you know your checking account that was getting almost zero and you moved it to a money market fund that's probably getting 5% or maybe you, you, know, you took it to Marcus and getting almost you know, 5%. So you're basically moving your money out of the bank's deposits so that you could um, get basically what's market rate. And so that was happening to every SNL in the country, and that was causing them basically to go insolvent. And then the last point, which you started to bring up, which is, there, is that your home mortgage, you could now go get from the markets. You didn't have to get it from a bank. You could get it from a broker. Yeah. And this takes us into kind of the late 1970s, early 1980s. So these economic pressures are really squeezing the thrifts from both sides. Now, at this point, the regulators and the government kind of have an interesting choice. One is do what they can to try to keep the SNLs going and hope that, you know, over time they are restored to health. Or they could have taken some steps to resolve the problem very early on. For example, they could have paid back the depositors of the thrifts, but sh otherwise shuttered the operations of all of these insolvent SNLs and tried to resolve the problem early. Uh, they didn't do that. They passed a series of laws in the early 1980s that did the opposite, that tried to keep the SNLs going through a variety of means. Uh, so what should we know about what happened in you know, roughly the 1980 to 1982 period? Right. So we're transitioning from the background to sort of like, okay, how, how, did, the, how did the government respond? So we call it like the makings of the crisis, right? Um, so many of errors in this. It's hard to, it's hard to, <laughs> it's hard to uh, enumerate them. But let me just say a few things. I, I really feel like, again, in the, uh, the 1980s, there was a big idea, right? Reagan gets elected on this idea of basically big government needs to go, you know, go away. We need to deregulate. And mm -hmm. so underneath, I think of the decision to ignore the problem and sort of kick the can and hope the SNL sort of grow their way out. I think we're two main things. We're through, I guess, really three. One was this big idea called deregulation. Two is SNLs were loved 
And I think they didn't want to shut the industry down. Mm-hmm. And three, it was going to cost a lot of money. It was going to co- cause a government bailout. Nobody wanted a government bailout. That was unattractive politically. So there was a lot of reasons for the politicians to want to sort of sweep it under the rug and hope it goes away naturally. Yeah. And, and even more specifically, the regulators and the government did a few things. Um, they allowed the SNLs to have looser capital standards, okay, which essentially bought them a little bit of time. They didn't enforce capital standards very much, and they deliberately you know, chose not to enforce the capital standards that they already had on the books, even the, even the, the relaxed ones. They also started allowing SNLs to make investments other than just in home mortgages. So SNLs were freed after the early 1980s to invest in other kinds of financial products. They were free to invest in commercial real estate. They were free to invest in junk bonds, which, you know, junk bonds were, were becoming very, very popular in the 1980s, most famously because of uh, Michael Milken and Drexel. Um, and so SNL suddenly had the ability to take on way more risks than they had in the past. And they were given a little bit of leniency, a lot of leniency, actually, by the government um, to basically stay alive for a little bit longer in the hopes that by doing business a different way that they would be restored to health. Yeah, let me just like double down on that. In retrospect, it looks like uh, so negligent to be almost criminal. But at the time, you know, the idea was, you know, big idea was free markets. So what happens is the SNLs, if you just have freed them up, they could basically innovate and grow and, and sort of grow their way out of the hole. And interest rates were falling. And they sort of say, okay, well, this will work itself out because the markets will, will um, kind of do their magic. And the part that seems like borderline criminal is that just the way that the Congress and regulators ignored the problems that were happening, they changed the accounting rules. These SNLs didn't have to follow GAAP. They got rid of lending limits. There's no LTV. They could invest basically in anything. There was a ton of lobbying. I think that like everybody knows that industry lobbies affect government, but you could see how the SNL lobby really affected the regulator and and Congress. And so, (laughs) you know, you have an SNL, a savings and loan that is wiped out, has no equity, right? Let's say you're the Mm -hmm. CEO of this um, savings and loan and you have no equity in it and you're like, okay, well, the only way to save it is basically like to grow our way. We have to to make more profitable loans with with fatter interest rates and bigger fees. We got to drive income to basically get out of this hole. And so you, it's natural for you to take on more risk. And that I think is a really important part of the human behavior here. When you have nothing left to lose, right? You're going to, gamble, you're going to risk it. So like the incentives here were all aligned towards the SNLs, which again, most of which were insolvent by this time in the mid 1980s or early 1980s uh, to take these enormous risks, including, as you noted, by investing in a lot of products that they didn't understand and were absolutely not specialists in. You know who was a specialist in all these products? The people selling them, (laughs) right? One of the things that was really exciting to real estate people back then in the 80s was that you could go buy a building with a 100% loan. So if you're going to buy a building for $10 million, they would loan you $11 million. <laughs> mm-hmm. So, I mean, the real estate people who I know were like, there was great time because we could really get great loans. We could do all these deals. And th- what the thrift got was big fees. So, so if, you know, in an $11 million loan on a property, maybe the thrift would get $500,000 fee. $500,000 fee is terrific because it helps get you out of the hole of losses that you, the thrift's insolvent. So they have to dig their way out by making extra profits. And then everybody working there starts getting paid, right? Mm-hmm. And so now you're getting big salaries, big parties. And so taking risk looks really attractive in the beginning. And they did. Yeah, they took enormous risks. And by the way, the the point about regulatory capture that you noted is really important. This was the era of a lot of financial scandals related to the thrifts. The most famous one, of course, is from Lincoln Savings and Loan, which was run by a guy named Charles Keating, um, who was later, by the way, convicted on all kinds of charges, right? And Mm -hmm. all kinds for all kinds of crimes. Um, But what he did was he 
essentially paid massive campaign contributions to the famous Keating Five senators, uh, hoping to get lenient regulations. And what we also know is that back then, one of the private advisors to Lincoln, to Charles Keating, who was writing letters on his behalf to the regulators, was a little guy named Alan Greenspan, who later <laughs> became the chair of the Fed, right? So th this, was, this was kind of a dirty time in finance. And a lot of that dirtiness also applied to the SNLs, but that's not all that was going on. There were economic things happening at the time as well. So for example, in the mid 1980s, there was a big commercial real estate bubble that was driven partly by higher oil prices, which drove up the cost of real estate in Texas, of course, which produces a lot of oil. And so the, the thrifts were essentially lending into a bubble. That bubble was partially also fueled by regulations passed in the 1980s, or deregulations, I should say, that were later reversed. And so regulations drove up the bubble and then contributing to the bubble bursting. But when the bubble did burst around 1986, the thrifts lost so much money because they had let right into the bubble because they had been allowed to lend into the commercial real estate sector, which was something they'd never been able to do before. And so after this period of illusory growth for the SNLs in the mid 1980s, because they were taking all these risks and things were good for a time, then when the real estate bubble collapsed, oil prices collapsed, all kinds of other things started happening, the true insolvency of the thrifts wasn't just revealed. It had gotten so much worse than it had been earlier in the decade when the regulators and the government failed to resolve the crisis. Yeah. Okay, let me add to that because we're we're getting Please. to the crescendo here, and it's really it's really interesting. Yep. So, the regulators probably could have resolved the SNL crisis for about twenty five billion dollars in the early eighties, approximately. Mm -hmm. There's really how much it actually cost is there's so many different numbers here. I think it cost at least two hundred fifty billion. We should we can talk about that later, but it, it the, they magnified the problem by ten x, yeah. and two hundred fifty billion in nineteen. 80 something used to be a lot of money. Mm -hmm. um, I want to just point out sort of the, the, <laughs> the big mistake, the biggest mistake the regulators and the Congress made around deregulation is they deregulated sort of the asset side of the business, right? But the bank still had government insured or implicitly government insured deposits. Yeah, the thrifts did. The thrifts, sorry, the yeah. thrifts yeah. did. Yeah. So you basically, here you are a thrift, you essentially effectively can borrow infinite amount from people backed by the government, and then turn around and lend anything you want. So you deregulated only half the business. You'd gotten rid of deposit insurance, full deregulation, free markets probably would have done their magic. But here you only deregulated half of it and left deposit insurance. And that was the big mistake. But the part, the sort of deeper insight I want to point out here is the 80s were a go-go period, totally go-go. And I think one of the things economists really miss, classical economists, they, they believe in this idea of supply and demand. That's what sets prices. And I, I think what you see over and over again is supply of money determines the supply of products much more than I think the, the, the economics or classical economics say about the supply and demand is set by demand for the product and supply of, of producers. And so there was too much real estate built, housing and and office buildings and hotels because there was so much supply of money, right? If you could get, if someone would give you billions to build, you know, people would do it. And, and we saw the same thing happen, I think recently, like for example, with the tech bubble, there was so much supply of money because of quantitative easing. Th there was just a bubble in a lot of things because there was oversupply of money, nothing to do with demand from customers. Mm -hmm. And so that's what caused this real estate and Wall Street boom through the 80s. Yeah. And it's worth pausing also to understand where the sort of locus of danger was here. So the depositors, as you noted, are insured and the federal government had a regulator that was supposed to manage a fund that would pay back depositors when SNLs would fail. But that fund consistently was way underfunded. It didn't have nearly enough money in it to pay back depositors for all of the massive losses that the SNLs were suffering, right? Mm -hmm. And so that may have been part of the impetus for just kind of kicking the can down the road in the early 1980s. But the problem was that by allowing the SNLs to take these bigger risks, its bad assets, 
ended up becoming way bigger, too, right? So that by the mid to late 1980s, it wasn't just that its mortgage loans had gone bad. All of these other super risky financial products that they had bought had also gone bad. And now you have all of these depositors, most of whom, by the way, are like mom and pop types, right? Like this wasn't, these weren't like sophisticated financial institutions themselves. The depositors and thrifts were like normal folks. And the government didn't have nearly enough money in its deposit insurance fund to essentially pay them back if it had allowed the SNLs to go under sooner. And so what happens in 1987 is that the Government Account Accountability Office does a study essentially saying, sorry, but most savings and loans are in fact insolvent, but that the insurance fund by a massive amount doesn't have nearly enough money to potentially compensate the insured depositors. And so what does Congress do? It, again, kicks the can down the road for another couple of years, topping up the insurance fund, but not by nearly enough. I mean, the magnitude of the shortfall is so, I mean, it's so, it's, I can put it's numbers almost to it. impossible I have, to I think about. Yes, please, yeah. please do, because it <laughs> splits my head open. Yeah, yeah. So it costs at least $150 billion. That's a minimum. I think there's a lot of off-balance off sheet financing. That, that's why it's much bigger, in my opinion. The, the insurance fund had six billion, <laughs> right? And so Congress, the re the, clearly what happened in 1987 when, or 86 and seven when they kicked the can is basically it's too close to the election. And actually I have a quote from the guy who ends up taking over here. I have a quote from the guy. Oh, please. Actually, funny. I, I love, I love me a good quote from the, from yeah. the Hades. So, the, so the, <laughs> the guy who ends up taking over all this stuff, his name's William Seidman. He ends up running the Resolution Trust Corporation. And mm -hmm. he says, quote, without a question, President Reagan dumped it on President Bush. I've learned agencies don't want problems on their watch. They will do anything to defer problems to the next fellow's regime. And another or another really good one, if you want to get salacious here. So one of the Please. most uh, sort of like, I have, I have uh, two good vignettes or stories. One is that one of the uh, worst offenders was a company called Silverado. Mm -hmm. And so Silverado was an SNL. It goes belly up. They go and tell regulators that they're going belly up in August of 1988. A month before that, their board member, Neil Bush, George H.W. Bush's son and George W. Bush's brother, resigns mm -hmm. from the board. <laughs> He's basically on his watch, you know, super complicit in <laughs> a lot of really, really dirty stuff with Silverado. So they go to the regulators, yeah. they were insolvent in August. 1988. And the regulator says, we'll, we'll, we'll give you till November 1988 to work this out. We'll give you till mm -hmm. the day after the election before we're going to declare you Perfect. insolvent because we don't want George Bush's son being caught up in this sort of like really nasty um, uh, savings and loan debacle. Yeah. yeah. And what was this? What was the second uh, thing? Oh, the second one, I just, there's another company called Vernon uh, SNL that that blew up. It closed in March 1987. I thought it was interesting to give you some stats here. So $1.4 billion in assets. 96% of its loans were in default. Oh my God. This <laughs> is astonishing. And it cost taxpayers $1.3 billion. Yeah. That's how yeah. nasty, right? You're talking about huge losses. Yeah. And I, I think the bailout, uh, portion for Lincoln Financial, which was the biggest of all of them, you know, the one that was being run by Charles Keating mm -hmm. was something like $3 billion. Uh, and at one point they had like two thirds of their assets in junk bonds. You know, it's a thrift. Like this is not what these places are supposed to be doing. So th this is all kind of amazing. And the end result was that finally, once George Herbert Walker Bush was in office, everybody kind of got their act together, realized that this had to end. And they essentially abolished both the regulator and the insurance fund and put up tens of billions of dollars. I can't remember what the final amount was uh, to essentially pay off the depositors. And they put a lot of all the bad loans of the thrifts into the RTC, the Resolution Trust Corporation, to be sold off to private industry through the years. That took another, I think, five or six years. Mm -hmm. Um, after it was established. And that was the beginning of the end of the SNL crisis. Right. And and some lessons here, not to get to the full lesson learned, but sort of one of the things that happens, right? You said this, 
there's a boom and the boom is sort of self-perpetuating. It's a, it starts to feed on itself and prices go higher and, and the loans look good. And so there's this period that basically where the losses get bigger because the booms just has a, a head of steam. And the same thing happens with the bust. When things go bad, it starts to feed on itself. And there's like this systemic compounding nature of downturns, just like upswings. And so what happens basically, in addition to that is also there's like coincidences. So what happens coincidentally is oil prices fall 50%. And that makes the bust worse. There's all this overbuilding in real estate. Um, legislation, basically, you mentioned it, but there's like really important legislative changes that make the real estate industry basically go bankrupt. This is the worst real estate crisis in American history. It's worse than 2008. It might be up there with the depression. It's, it's a tough call. Uh, but the thing that I think was wild is that basically before the Tax Reform Act of 1986, real estate developers would do a deal and have these these passive losses, which is basically in real estate, you can depreciate your assets, you can have interest rate reductions, and you could take those, quote, paper losses and sell them. Mm -hmm. And so everybody in real estate in the 80s, not only were they getting 100% loans, but people were buying into real estate through a company called real estate syndication. Investors were buying into it and buying these losses to cover their taxes. To be clear, if you owed tax liabilities and you then also had these like passive tax losses that you could buy from other places or these passive losses that would offset your tax liability in the current moment, even if in economic terms, it wasn't quite right that something should depreciate that quickly. Yeah, think, right. think about it right now. If you had uh, $50,000 in taxes you owed, you could turn around and buy from a real estate person $50,000 in losses. Maybe you could pay $35,000 for it. Right. And now you have no taxes owed and the real estate developer just got $35,000 for selling a paper a paper loss, right? Yeah. He got 100% loan on the property. So that basically, they get rid of that. And then they also basically like this, the the financial institutions reform recovery and enforcement act which is the big you know the government finally under you said george uh hw bush kind of rushes the snl industry because they're pissed because basically congress has egg on their face for believing the snls that they were honest and and they you know basically they got lobbied to not regulate them and they turned out to be a big mistake and so what this they called it firea what it did is it made the SNLs have to dump a lot of assets. It made them forced sellers. And that forced selling caused the market to collapse. And a really good kind of vignette of that is the junk bond market. Mm -hmm. And I actually, I went out as part of my obsession with the SNL crisis. I've talked to people, a lot of people from that era. And one of my favorite uh, people I talked to, I got to this person who was the kind of like private market broker in charge of selling most of the assets when they basically government took them over. And so he basically was the, um, so the Resolution Trust Corporation, the RTC, ended up taking all the assets. Current terms, they call it a bad bank. Form a bad bank, take all the bad assets, put it in there, but half a trillion dollars of assets back then. And then they had to sell them. And he basically was the main seller, main broker. And I went and talked to him he used to work at Drexel Burnham. And his narrative of kind of what went wrong, because what happened is basically when the government passed Fi FIREA, all the SNLs had to dump their junk bonds. Mm -hmm. And that caused the junk bond market to collapse and then eventually put Drexel Burnham into bankruptcy. And then Michael Milken goes to jail. And so his, <laughs> his version of the story I don't think he's read enough about the history of this. He just lived it. Was that right. the banks were behind that. He felt like the banks hated Drexel Burnham and they stuck that into the legislation so that it would force Drexel Burnham out of business. So he, I, I don't know if that's true, but they basically, because Drexel was like eating the banks' lunch at the time. And Ben, I think that's a good place to now start talking about the lessons of the SNL crisis for what's happening now. Why don't we start with governments and, and policymakers and regulators? What do you think are the main lessons that we should take from the crisis? Yeah, because one of the reasons why it's so important is that um, 2008 financial crisis, the policymakers 
who made all the big decisions that you can think of during that period lived through this crisis, lived through the SNL crisis. And they saw firsthand kind of what worked and what didn't work. I think one of the reasons why um, at least the regulatory response on 2008 financial crisis is actually was good in comparison, like just to put some numbers to it, right? The SNL crisis had about 3,000 SNLs and banks go out of business Mm -hmm. at the end of all of this mess, right? By 1995. And um, in the 2008 financial crisis, it was about 500 banks. Obviously, some of them were quite big, <laughs> but there was a, a lesson, I think, that that really, I think the main lesson they learned was that that the RTC, there was this idea of um, take all the bad assets and put them into this sort of giant bad bank called the Resolution Trust Corporation, the RTC. The RTC ended up with, as I said, about half a trillion dollars of real estate assets at that time, which, you know, I don't know, two trillion today or something. There's 120,000 properties, and there were 4,000 people working at the RTC to sell all these loans, I mean, sell all these assets. So it's just a massive policy approach, and you saw nothing like that in 2008. There was no, let's take all the bad assets and sort of sell them off through the government. Like, I think they really did, they took a sort of opposite approach, which became famous as extend and pretend. Extend and pretend, kick the can, and that, I think, was a, a really important lesson from 1992 to 2008. And some of the lessons not learned. (laughs) (laughs) I'd love to say one of the lessons to learn is like, don't be captured by the industry, but that's probably always going to be a risk, right? Like that, that danger is never going to go away of people in an industry lobbying with huge amounts of money to get regulations, you know, twisted in their direction. Um, sometimes maybe those regulations might even make sense, but very often it's just being made in order to help industry players make more money. That certainly was the case back then, right? Yeah. And again, I mean, in 2008, if I were to split, I would say the regulators did a pretty good job and have done a pretty good job since then. I mean, they did a terrible job in the eighties, absolutely failure F. Uh, and, and since then, I think the regulators have just much more sophisticated, better resourced. Reagan cut the member examiners cut the budget of the regulator of these savings and loans during this period. So, so I think the regulators get higher, much, much higher marks now and that, mm-hmm. and that the politicians get as bad, if not worse marks. Cause you think about leading up to 2008 financial crisis, same thing happens, the same kind of combination of, of Bush and Clinton deregulated Congress encourages home ownership. And that's basically like Fannie and Freddie blow up. And then, all this financial innovation, and you end up with the same sort of problem as the SNL crisis. Just you know, instead of five hundred billion, it's five trillion or something. It's right, much much bigger um, potential yeah. downside from the banking crisis of '08. Yeah. Plus, you know, you had the introduction of Dodd Frank. You have much more careful scrutiny of capital standards at the banks, certainly at the big banks, and, and now a lot of the midsize and regional Sorry, banks. What are you talking about? Oh, nine, ten, only after the cr- crisis. Yeah, yeah, I'm talking about in the time since the the great financial yeah, crisis, yeah, yeah. right? Right. Um, just a lot more scrutiny. Perhaps more dangerous is what's happening now in the you know uh, non bank lending sector. But at least in terms of the biggest banks, you do have regulators still paying a lot of attention to them. You still have stress tests. You still have um, just a, an environment where there's still, frankly, a lot of skepticism towards like, quote unquote, big finance. And that has not gone away, even though the the 2008, 2009 crisis was now, you know, 14 years into the past. And so I I think you're right about regulators generally doing a better job now than they were in the 1980s, certainly, which was just famously, uh, you know, like a, like (laughs) one long rodeo. Yeah. Two quick things on this. It's um, the place where we're seeing the recent blow up in banking sector which is banks bigger than 50 billion and smaller than 250 billion was deregulated by Trump. So, you know, in, I guess it was 2018, he deregulated that kind of slice of the banking sector. And that's where Silicon Valley Bank and Signature and, and First Republic, that's really where we've seen the problems. And so like one of the lessons should be learned and, and we will never learn is that you really can't deregulate banking if you're going to give them deposit insurance. Yeah. Um, and the other kind of a smaller point, just the difference between then and, and 
recent crises, OA or or even recent, is in the SNL crisis, the government put 3,600 executives in prison. Mm -hmm. They really went after the executives that time, and we did not see that after 08. Correct. Yep. Okay. So those are those are a couple of good lessons, right? So about you know regulation and about the government. Um, what else? Uh, what what's the next bucket uh, that you would put the lessons of the SNL crisis into? Well, let me go to my two favorites, which is the Big Bang of real yeah. estate and banking. So, like, let me do banking first, more briefly. But just to to realize that before this, you know, modern banking didn't exist. So basic banking before this was fragmented by state, by asset class, by business, and and by corporate structure. Mm -hmm. Previously, banks weren't allowed to interstate banking before mm, early 80s, basically. And mm -hmm. as part of this deregulation, they allowed the banks to banks become national banks, like City Citigroup and Bank of America bought up a lot of, of players and became national banks as we know them today. Before that, they didn't exist, right? Everything was regional. SNLs did home mortgages and banks did corporate lending to big companies. That's right. the way the world existed back then. And then now banks lend to home mortgages and commercial real estate and corporate lending and consumer lending. But before, the different structures only lent to their category. There wasn't this idea of sort of a sort of supranational bank doing all lending to all kinds of uh, assets. And then the idea of sort of commerce. You have credit cards, checking account as a form of like running uh, your business. That was separated. SNLs weren't allowed to do that. So commerce, banking, and security business, which was basically what investment banks do versus what banks used to do. And that got eliminated right finally by the end of this sort of period. So you end up with all banks doing all kinds of businesses. And the corporate structure, right? Way mm -hmm. back in the day, 80% of the SNLs were mutuals, right? They weren't right. joint stock companies. And most banks and investment banks, especially, were partnerships. And when they went public, I mean, there's basically been this normalization to public joint stock corporations. That's where all banks are today. Right. And so all of these things were not the case before the 1980s. So you're, you're talking about, the, this is why I say it's the birth of the modern banking sector. It comes at this change in epics. And what is the sort of, uh, what is the takeaway from that evolution for now, given that, as you said, the banking system, the modern financial landscape is so different now than it was back then. Are there any lessons that we should be careful not to learn just because the environment is so different? People's memories are short. So the mistakes we made in the 80s will be ancient history. Maybe they almost already are. So we'll surely make that mistake again. People who remember in 08 or 2020, you know, won't remember them in 2030. So I think that there's like a <laughs> sad human behavior of repetition um, that is definitely, definitely a takeaway from all of this history. Yeah. And Ben, right now we're in an environment where the Fed is raising rates. We already saw earlier this year that some mid-sized banks were squeezed in kind of a similar way as the SNLs were squeezed in the late 70s and early 80s in that interest rates are rising, their loan portfolios were losing value, and they were losing depositors to money market mutual funds, just like back mm -hmm. then. Mm -hmm. um, there was some stress there, but the government did, you know, did backstop a lot of what was happening, which was, I guess, helpful to stop there to stop any kind of contagion at the time, but we're still in that environment right now. Interest rates are high, possibly still rising. Um, and so at least that has been one place that's been a source of stress, mid-sized banks. But I'm, I'm wondering what else we should be paying attention to given the lessons of the SNL crisis. Yeah, the source of the problems in SNLs was interest rate risk. Interest rates changed and they took huge losses. That's happened again. And the scale is smaller because it went from zero to 5% or as opposed to from five to 20. But the m amount of financial instruments in, in the country or the world much bigger. Because not just the United States, the same thing happened in Europe, right? Where we had negative rates in Europe. And so there's an embedded amount of losses in the world's financial system that are not marked in market, just like 
before, you know, in the trillions, right? Maybe even, maybe even more than in the trillions. It's hard to say. And one of the sort of interesting things you take away from looking back at it is that happens in the early eighties, right? By nineteen eighty-two or eighty-three, it was clear that they were insolvent. SNLs were insolvent, and it doesn't blow up until seven or eight years later. So it takes a long time. Because everybody's basically trying to sort of kick the can, um, provide some coverage, hope it works itself out. And that is exactly what's happening now. And a very similar program is the bank term funding program. So basically, that's a program the Fed created when Silicon Valley Bank failed. Basically says, oh, you have these mortgages that are underwater because of interest rates. We'll lend you, the Fed will lend you 100%. Right. And give you liquidity. And so that's maybe a good program, maybe not, but it's it's a similar kind of idea. If the sentiment is like, okay, there's these embedded losses because of the change in interest rates, we need to figure out ways to sort of like kick this can so that hopefully mm-hmm. it works itself out. Um and and what happened last time was that it it got a lot worse as a result, not a lot better. That makes sense. One big difference, at least it seems to me, is that back then the regulators essentially allowed, made possible, uh, made it possible for the SNLs to take these new and much bigger risks that they didn't understand. That actually does not seem to be happening in this case. There is some kick the can stuff going on, but they're not saying that suddenly small and mid-sized regional banks can take on huge risks that they didn't understand before. If anything, I think the the regulators are clamping down a little more, insisting on very stringent enforcement of strong capital standards and so forth. And, you know, earlier this year, you know, one of the banks at least was sold, the one that wasn't working out right. Signature Bank was bought by New York Community Board. So like some of this is a little bit different. The scale of the problem is certainly different. So it does seem like some of the lessons have been learned. Uh, What do you think about that? Yeah, I think it's way better, way, way, way better than before. I mean, just a we didn't put numbers to this, but going into the early 80s, the SNL started with only maybe three or 4% equity to debt. Mm-hmm. So they were, you know, whatever that is, 30 times levered. So that's that's how much equity, because typically they were mutually owned, right? So they, they right. They, where would the equity come from? There was no source of equity because it was, it was a mutual bank. And, um, this time, coming off of 08, we really went into a pro-regulatory environment, and that in the 2010s, banks got heavily regulated, and I think that was protected us. They have much more equity, they're much more conservative, and so we're going into a similar uh, interest rate change, but with a much better footing. Yeah. And finally, Ben, you know, uh, we always want to tie what we're saying into like what you're doing at Fundrise. What do you think are the big lessons for investors of the SNL crisis and its parallels to what's happening right now? Right. We finally got back to my uh, sort of my true obsession, which is how did it, <laughs> how did the SNL crisis rebirth the the real estate industry? Yeah, the real estate industry is totally unrecognizable from where it was before this. Um. And so what, what happened is that the real estate industry essentially got burnt down. By the end of the SNL crisis, there's no money in the sector. Basically, everybody's foreclosed on. The RTC ends up owning you know, most of the, <laughs> the most assets, most real estate assets in America. I mean, mm-hmm. it's a little bit of exaggeration. And out of that, out of this sort of period is a kind of a rebirth is Phoenix and everything we take for granted as normal in real estate. So this is how normal it is. This is how people do real estate didn't exist and were birthed in this period. So real estate private equity, which is now a trillion dollar space, didn't exist really before this. CMBS, which we had a, a Shecky on here, you know, that's a trillion dollar industry that was birthed out of this. Public REITs, which really didn't exist before this, got birthed out of this. And so let me just give you a little bit more about this this rebirth because it's fascinating because I think that's yeah. That's what likely to happen again in some form or fashion. Okay. So let's talk about sort of like private equity, real estate private equity. So yeah. why does it get birthed out of this period? Well, so if the RTC is going to sell 120,000 properties, 
they don't sell them one by one. They sell them in pools, a pool of like a thousand loans or a thousand properties. Mm-hmm. So who can buy a thousand properties? Like only another pool, only a pooled right. vehicle of, of investors, private equity funds. So basically that's what Wall Street shows up, says, okay, we'll create these private equity vehicles. And, you know, basically the first portfolio that's sold by the RTC is sold to a partnership 50-50 between Blackstone and Goldman and, and this guy, Joe Robert, who used to work at RTC um, and then ended up running this first private equity uh, transaction. So all the big names you would know of in real estate got their start in this period. Like everybody, Starwood, Apollo, Cerberus, Canyon, Barry Sterling, right. Leon Black. I mean, just every real estate mogul was either created or wiped out. All the guys I've had on my podcast, they were wiped out in this period. They didn't talk about it. And then they basically <laughs> rebuild their wealth. So, <laughs> and, and even the idea of a co- private equity fund, that's actually was, used to be called an opportunity fund. It was invented by Sam Zell and Richard Saltzman um, in 1987. They invent this idea of a pool vehicle. They go around to 48 pension funds. They convince them to do this. And Zell ends up buying everything. He gets his nickname, The Grave Dancer. He was going to be on my show, uh, actually, in, in May. And I know Richard Saltzman. And so he ends up buying you know, tons of office buildings. He takes it public, becomes equity office, which he sells to Blackstone for $39 billion. He also created Equity Residential, Kimco. All the public REITs basically have to go public. The only source of liquidity is the public markets. And so you're talking about this massive sort of birth. And I have two quotes here. I'll give you one from the Washington Post, 1995. They called it, quote, the greatest transfer of wealth outside of armed rebellion in the history of this country. Yeah. Extraordinary. I'm, uh, I'm wondering, Ben, if there is something of that story in the latest rise of private credit funds, which are often investing in the kinds of credit that the mid-sized banks are pulling back from right now, partly because of the economic environment and the stresses that those mid-sized sized banks experienced earlier this year. Yeah, I mean, that just generally the rise of private markets, essentially that instead of getting credit from banks, wh- whatever kind of credit it is, you can get it from the private markets. They're now bigger, 25 trillion. They're not bigger than the banking industry. And I used to be a skeptic of it and that there, it gets a lot of um, negative ink in press. The journalists always talk about shadow banking, the regulators talk about it, but it's actually exactly what we were saying earlier. Nobody in the private market is government guaranteed. They're taking risks on their investment. And so I, I think it's actually, it just makes sense it would be the future. And over time, we find that government guarantees of deposits and the way banking intermediates finance starts to really look like an anachronistic idea, something from the past. Hmm. Yeah. Interesting. Although I will say that, you know, in the time before government insured deposits, there were many more bank runs. There were many more financial crises. It was more common and they were enormous. A lot of economists credit the introduction of insurance, both with fewer financial crises overall, but also with kind of fueling bigger crises when they do happen because all of this money ends up chasing higher returns in the unregulated parts of the financial sector. Right. But that was before money market funds. And you can imagine a world where you save in a fund that doesn't lend. That's money markets Mm -hmm. or a bank that just owns treasuries. And you don't have this idea where you save and then the bank turns around and lends it out. And that's just a different way to intermediate finance. And you know, one that doesn't doesn't need the government. And so it's it's the government backstop that's the problem. And that 10 years from now, you know, when people forget about, you know, how how bank reg- deregulation is a problem and we have another blow up, which has, you know, pretty much always happened in history of finance. You might see that technology has made intermediation of finance, you know, basically better than using an old-fashioned bank. I mean, if you think about it, in some sense, you know, if you end up having these kinds of private credit funds, these vehicles, 
And if those vehicles themselves don't take on too much leverage, because by the way, some of them do, right? But if they don't take on too much leverage, then it's kind of like equity financing of credit, right? Which is, if you think about it, like very safe because all of the losses are absorbed by the equity investors. I think you still are going to have to have a government backstop part of the financial markets because individual investors, small investors, retail types, right? Like, like normal folks like me. OK, like they don't want to be doing a ton of like research about the bank that they're putting their money in. They just want to like put their small amount of money into a bank. Know they can use it for basic services like checking accounts and that it's safe. Right. So I, I think you're still going to have to have that part of the financial landscape be government backstopped, which means you're still going to need regulators. But it could make, make sense for the landscape to be more varied. You know what I mean? What do you think about all that? Well, I'm going further and saying that, you know, you don't save in banks in the future. You save into money market funds or other kinds of uh, new instruments and that the government backstop of banks and general way we treat debt has been to subsidize it. And if, mm -hmm. we, if we had debt priced like equity, well, borrowing from more expensive, which isn't necessarily bad. And individuals wouldn't be taking credit risk, which is not how the system would work. And so that, you know, we're a long way from that, but AI and things like that could could potentially be a disruptive way system. You know, think about intermediation. That's mediation is what technology is best at, arguably better than banks. So, you know, we're we're in speculation here. So this, it, it, we're still at least a decade from probably we need one more blow up <laughs> before people finally abandoned uh this this uh, way we did banking for the last couple hundred years. Uh, I love it, man. AI and financial intermediation. That's a future onward episode if I've ever heard it, because you're talking my talk now. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, Ben, any final thoughts on lessons of the SNL crisis uh, before we wrap up? It's wonderful to see the big picture in retrospect. Like I, I guess I, uh, the, the last sort of interesting thing I summarize is that these big ideas are what really animate a decade. So you had deregulation in the 80s, you had a tech bubble in the 90s, you had a housing bubble in the 2000s, you had QE and ZERP in the 2010s, and now you have AI. And there's like a saying, like, where wise men start, fools follow. Mm -hmm. And that's like, I think like the lesson is that, you know, it's if something that looks good in the beginning, will get overextended and, and no longer make sense. And, and the pendulum um, will swing too far. I almost feel that way today about the way everybody thinks you're there won't be a um, recession because the pendulum is today sitting exactly perfectly. Inflation is well tamed. There's unemployment is low, and the pendulum is exactly at midnight. But the <laughs> but the momentum of that pendulum is taking us towards more monetary tightening, and we haven't seen the full impact. So um, that's what I mean about the history and the cycles and the patterns and and um, why I love them so much. All right. That's a that's a great place to start wrapping up. I want to end, Ben, with something a little different. You know, you and I did some deep dives. We did a lot of reading in preparation for this episode. And I just wanted to recommend to our listeners some of the stuff that we read in case they want to pursue this themselves a little further. You read a book by Martin Lowey called High Rollers Inside the Savings and Loan Debacle. Uh, recommended? Yay or nay? Oh, yeah. And I reached out to the author, Martin Lowey, to see if I could okay. talk to him because it was the best. For somebody who's obsessed with this, it was the best yeah. book I've read on it ever. Yeah, and and that book goes really deep on all these themes, but it also gives a nice summary, a nice clear analysis of uh, of what happened. Um, so that's what you read. I read like individual chapters of a few other books to kind of round out our source material here, and I, I can highly recommend a few of these. One is there's a forthcoming book by economist Linda Yu called The Great Crashes that has a chapter on the SNLs. There's an essay, a really short essay by Michael Lewis in a little known book of his called The Money Culture from 1991 that talks about the role of Solomon Brothers and Wall Street and how they made a ton of money off of this crisis during the 1980s. And I recommend it partly because it's just funny because it's, it's Michael Lewis. It's very amusing. It's very humorous. Uh, and finally, there's a book by Sebastian Malaby, uh, a really great financial journalist about the life and times of Alan Greenspan called The Man who knew too much. And that's a strong recommendation. You can you can just look up SNLs in the index and go straight to those chapters. So really great. Yeah, awesome. Uh, look at us. Uh, if not 
resident financial historians, uh, students of financial history. Is it, is it accurate to call ourselves that? Hopefully, always a student. <laughs> Always a student. Excellent. All right. So let's close out the show. Thanks to everybody for listening. You've been listening to Onward, the Fundrise podcast featuring Ben Miller, CEO of Fundrise. My name is Cardiff Garcia of Bizarre Audio. We invite you again to please send your comments and questions to onward at fundrise.com. And if you like what you heard, rate and review us on Apple Podcasts and be sure to follow us wherever you listen to podcasts. Finally, for more information on Fundrise sponsored investment products, including relevant legal disclaimers, please check out our show notes. This podcast was produced by the Podcast Consultant. Thanks so much again for listening and we'll see you next episode. Yeah.